we're just we just introduced it last week. In fact, I was trying to figure out what we the fact that we didn't cover everything I wanted to say about the Viper at the beginning, I was wondering, well, what did I say? <laughs> but I'm not going to listen to the tape and find out. <laughs> I know in my notes where I left off and, and uh, familiarize you with this. Paul is, and, and a whole crew from a ship, there's actually 276 that have uh, uh, landed at Melita, which is uh, Malta today, uh, just out off the foot of, of Italy there. Um, where they were washed ashore, the, the ship almost made it all the way in, finally lodged in the rocks and started breaking apart, and they made it on shore safely. And once they got on shore, they finally figured out where they were, that they, they were really close to their destination. That is, uh, they were on their way to Rome. Paul's a prisoner being taken there. And, uh, but anyhow, they, they've all arrived there. And on that island, as soon as they get there, some incidences take place. Uh, we're only interested in the, like I said, it's, it's three parts to the chapter. There's, uh, and really, there's really two parts to the chapter in this sense. That the first 16 verses of the chapter have to do with Paul's Gentile ministry. And then in the last, uh, from 17 to 31, it, it's Paul ministering to the Jews at Rome. And, uh, and, and it really, it's really contrasted that way when you look at the chapter. But even the first part of that in his ministry to the, to the Gentiles, it starts out where he's on the island, and there's just three sets of miracles that happen pretty quickly when Paul's on the island. Which, so I call that section is uh, three final uh, signs of Paul's apostleship. Because the purpose of mir miracles is to verify a person as being sent by God with a message, and that's what an apostle is. And, and so these, these three miracles are the three final signs in the book of Acts of, of Paul's apostleship to the Gentiles. And so that, that takes us from verses 1 through 10. Then in verses 11 through 16, it's Paul now resumes his travel to Rome. And what's really interesting is he's making his travel to Rome, all the people that he meets on the road on the way there. He, in one place, there's people actually ask him to stay seven days and have a Bible study, and he does. <laughs> then he moves on, and people start coming from Rome and meeting him. It looks like two different waves meet him as he's traveling to Rome. They hear about him coming, and they, they don't wait for him to get to the city. So he has this ministry on the way to Rome, and uh, you can read that on your own. And then in verses 17 uh, through 31, then, finally there at Rome, he addresses the Jews concerning uh, things that they might have heard about him and, and begins to minister to them. And just like the Jews in many of the uh, places of the world or all over the world, uh, when Paul introduces them to Jesus Christ, they reject his message. And then Paul warns them that their heart is uh, callous and that he's turned to the Gentiles because that's what God called him to do. And so that there's a final indictment uh, of the Jews, and that's how the book of Acts ends, and that was the purpose of the book of Acts, so it ends fulfilling its purpose. Now, with all that said, let me read the first ten verses so you see what we're going to cover today. It says, And when they were escaped, they knew that the island was called Melita, and the barbarous people showed us no little kindness, for they kindled a fire and received, every, received us, every one, because of the present rain and because of the cold. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, there came a viper out of the heat and fastened on his hand. And when the barbarians saw the venomous beast hanging on his hand, they said to themse among themselves, No doubt this man is a murderer, whom though he hath escaped the sea, yet vengeance suffereth not to live. And he shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. Howbeit they looked... When he should have swollen and uh, and and fallen down, uh, fallen down, and fallen down, dead suddenly, they. Uh, but after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their minds and said, "He is a god." In the same quarters were possessions of a of the chief man of the island, whose name was Publius who received us and lodged us three days courteously. And it came to pass that the father of Publius lies sick of a fever and of a bloody flux, to whom Paul entered in and prayed and laid his hands on him and healed him. So when this was done, others also that were diseased in the island came and were healed, who also honored us with many honors. And when we had 
uh, departed, they laid on us such things as were necessary. So, it's right there, you, not only did Paul do these miracles that they finally honored, Luke writes it and says us, and certainly the us centers around Paul and the things that he's done there because that's what the record shows. Um, so anyhow, there's those three miracles. There's the viper that latched on that didn't kill Paul, and then there is the, the, the father of Paul, Publius, who Paul laid his hands on and healed him, and then many come from the island and were healed of Paul. So those three miracles there that, that stand out, and we talked about the number three and, and how that represents God, and, and there's several places in the Bible. Paul prayed three times the infirmity be taken from him, and uh, Peter, when he saw the, the vision of, of, the, of the, the food that came down from heaven, he saw the vision three times. Anyhow, the there's certainly a testimony of God here uh, through, uh, by the Apostle Paul, or of the Apostle Paul, that he is the Apostle of the Gentiles. And, and it's not just about his, uh, that he is uh, sent from God, but when you see the purpose of miracles in the Bible, it's always to verify, to confirm the Word. We ended last class, and I don't think there's any, I don't think anybody could could question the fact, uh, I didn't read the verse, but if you look over at verse uh, 11, it says, and after three months we departed in a ship. So they ended up on this island, and it's three months later that they left. Well, as soon as he gets to the island, you see this, the miracle that took place while he's still, it's, they're still in the rain, still you know, warming up from the fire, this, this serpent comes out. I don't know, it seems like the three days that he spent with Publius had to be right after that, uh, and then, the, and then, then certainly it's during that three-month time that these people from the island are coming to Paul. But the point is, it's interesting that there's no message of Paul to the Gentiles here. You see the, the miracles that, that take place around the Apostle Paul, but not a message of Paul. And, and sometimes nothing said says a lot. <laughs> and uh, what I mean by that is I don't think any of you would question, I, don't, I would hope you wouldn't, that Paul ministered to these Gentiles on this island, that when it ended in verse 6 where it said, they first thought he, he must have been an evil man because he escaped the waters, but he's not going to escape the serpent, that like God's getting vengeance on this man, he must be a murderer. When he doesn't die, they changed their mind and decided he was a god. Well, I'm sure Paul didn't leave the island with everyone thinking he was a god. You know, we, taught, we demonstrated that in chapter 14 when they thought he was a god, how he turned, told them to turn from these vanities. You know, he would tell them who the true God was. But the very fact that that's not recorded in the book of Acts is telling you something about Luke's purpose in the book of Acts. Because when he gets to Rome and addresses the Jews, now it's going to be recorded. So you realize the book of Acts is a record of the Jews' rejection uh, of Jesus Christ, and yet uh, there's an evidence in the, in the record of Acts that the Apostle Paul has turned, been sent by God to the Gentiles. Now, if you want to know what the message of God is, what the Apostles' message is, well, the next book of your Bible is the book of Romans, <laughs> written by the Apostle Paul. Now you can learn Paul's doctrine from reading his books. But you're not going to learn Paul's doctrine from reading the book of Acts because Luke's purpose is to show the, an indictment against Israel of their rejection throughout the whole world. It began at Jerusalem and ended in Rome. And that's, that's the purpose of the book of Acts. So nothing being said says a lot about the book itself. Uh, but the miracles also, the very fact that when you, when you consider the miracles, they, the purpose of miracles is to verify not only the, the person as an apostle, but the message of that apostle. And, and I'll show you those, the, the, some of that proof already. I, I showed you from um, uh, Romans 15 last time when I made that statement. I, we went ahead and looked at that verse, but I, we won't look at it right now. Last time we looked at the fact of the viper and talked a little bit about a viper. Uh, it's not just a serpent jumping out, a viper, because a viper represents a poisonous snake. And you can see the, the people of the island knew what kind of snake this was. Knew, they actually knew that we just keep watching Paul, we're going to see him, was it, uh, what does it say, verse 6, Howbeit they looked when he should have swollen and fallen down dead suddenly. So they're waiting for him to swell up and then go into convulsions and drop dead. And when that didn't happen, they actually watch a great while and it still don't happen. That's when they change your mind and thought he was a god. So the viper is, is a poisonous snake that Paul, that he should have died, but he didn't. So I want to talk a little bit more about the viper. And, and there is a, 
whether it's here as a type, there certainly is an illustration of something here, and, and the fact that it uses the word viper. Go back to Matthew chapter 3. Satan is called a serpent, and, and even in, 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 the, in this passage in the book of Acts here, the, it first said in verse 5, you just go ahead into Matthew 3, but in verse 5 of Acts 28, he said, He shook off the beast into the fire and felt no harm. And after they were watching for him to die, it says, but, the, but after they had looked a great while and saw no harm came to him. So there is no, the, the, he felt no harm and no harm came to him that this viper didn't hurt him in the sense that uh, it caused a death. And uh, that's what they expected to happen. Uh, but I say that because a viper causes harm, uh, causes death. And in Matthew chapter 3, it begins with John the Baptist, later it will be Jesus Christ who will say the same thing, in dealing with the Pharisees of the nation of Israel, and even before Jesus Christ shows up, just John's introduction, just knowing the nature of these men, it says in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 7, But when he saw, this is John the Baptist, saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers! Who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? It's interesting that in the passages here that we're going to look at in the book of Matthew, that these rulers of Israel who are eventually going to oppose Jesus Christ, that actually religious men who are going to resist the truth and make sure that the nation resists the truth as well, that, that he calls them a generation of vipers. They're not just serpents in the sense of a snake. They're vipers in the sense that they got, they're poison. They cause harm. They bring about death. And, and he calls them a, a generation of vipers. And not only do they, are they called that, and, and you see there is a, an association here with Satan calling them that, but, but also that, that there's a warning of the wrath to come. That the generation of vipers, these vipers, they're going to be like Paul had the viper on his hand and he shook it into the fire. That these vipers are going to be cast into the fire. Look at verse 11. John says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that's, that, that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. A lot of people want the baptism of fire. But if you look at verse 12, you don't want the baptism of fire. Whose fan is in his hand, he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather the wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. <laughs> unquenchable fire is the lake of fire. It's hell, and uh, the, where the fire never goes out. Unquenchable fire. So Jesus Christ is going to take the believing remnant. He's going to baptize them with the Holy Ghost. They're going to have new life. They're going to have uh, the, the power of God to enter into the kingdom. The power to become sons of God, as it says in the book of John. But the ones like these vipers who John is refusing to baptize them, telling, asking them the question, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Part of that wrath is being cast in this fire that's never going to be quenched. The Lord's going to baptize them with the Holy Ghost and with fire. So here's vipers throwing in the fire, and we're talking about it in a spiritual sense. And, and remember, that's the theme of the book of Acts, is the book of Acts is not only did, did these men lead the, the nation of Israel against Jesus Christ in His crucifixion, but they also led them to reject the Holy Spirit, which takes place in the book of Acts. In fact, come to Matthew chapter 12. This is the passage where the Lord Jesus Christ warned that all manner of sin and blasphemy against Him would be forgiven. This is in this passage, like in verse 9, Matthew 12, verse 9, it says, And when he was departed thence, he went into, the, in, in, into their synagogue, and behold, there's a man that's lame, any, uh, that, uh, uh, what do you call it, not lame, uh, withered hand. And he heals them, and people start realizing who Jesus Christ is, and so the Pharisees come along and says in verse 24, it says, But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow doth cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. So the Pharisees start accusing Jesus Christ of being a devil. 
Jesus Christ then says in verse 31, Wherefore I say unto you, All manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, that's who Jesus Christ is, it shall be forgiven him. Now they just said some pretty cruel things, didn't, didn't they? But they can be forgiven for this. But, he says, whosoever shall speak against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, nor in the world to come. So blasphemy against the Holy Ghost. The, the Jesus Christ, when John the Baptist came, he said, I baptize you with water. Jesus Christ is going to baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. There, there's a, there is 2,000 years of grace between the baptism with the Holy Ghost that began on Acts chapter 2 to the believing remnant, and when Jesus Christ comes back after the age of grace in wrath and then casts them in the lake of fire. And, and so there's one of those places where there's a gap between those two statements. But, but here, the Lord Jesus Christ is talking about His ministry, and after His ministry has come the Holy Spirit's ministry, and the rejection of the Holy Spirit's ministry, there's no more forgiveness. Those who have rejected the Holy Spirit are going to be, there's no forgiveness in this world or the world to come, the kingdom that they're talking about. So, so there's a warning here that even what they said against Jesus Christ is going to be forgiven. He dies on the cross, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. He pours out the Holy Spirit, the twelve apostles continue to minister to the nation of Israel, and that Acts chapter 7, when Stephen sees Jesus Christ standing, he's ready to stand to pour out his judgment. And he warns the people, and rather than take the warning, they killed Stephen. That was the testimony of the book of Acts. But rather than that wrath coming, the testimony in the book of Acts is, all of a sudden Saul of Tarsus is saved and sent to the Gentiles, and that wrath never does come. The whole book of Acts, it never comes. Israel continuing to reject, but salvation is going to the Gentiles because this program has been interrupted. And, but, but the point here is there, there's no forgiveness under the ministry of the Holy Ghost in rejection. Verse 33 says, Either make the tree good, speaking about himself, and the fruit good, or else make, make the tree corrupt and the fruit corrupt. For, for the tree is known by his fruits. O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh. So he again, after he warns them about the judgment that's coming, he calls them a generation of vipers. Um, hold your place here. There's one more in Matthew I want to show you, but I, I keep thinking this, I keep jumping in my mind while I'm saying it, so I want to show you. Look at Acts chapter 2 again. This eluded me. I mean, just one of those things that stand out. And once you see it, you wonder, how did I miss all that? <laughs> see, the Lord keeps talking about a generation of vipers. And certainly the Pharisees, Sadducees and Pharisees are that generation of vipers. When Peter speaks on the day of Pentecost, the Lord has already died and rose and ascended back into heaven. And he convicts Israel that they rejected their Messiah. And they ask what we should do. He, he gives them that same offer that John offered, Acts 2.38. It says, Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and to all afar off, even as many as the Lord shall call. Now watch this verse. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourself from this untoward generation, this perverse, crooked generation. See, the gen he's talking about the Pharisees and, and that they actually represent a generation of rejectors of God and, and religious men who are influencing the whole nation. And so they're calling the nation to reject the religious influence, their leadership, religious leadership, and save yourself from them. Why do you need to save yourself from them? Well, if those guys are vipers. They're going to be thrown in the fire. <laughs> So you see that everywhere it's talked about. He calls them vipers, and he talks about this judgment that's going to come. Uh, back to chapter 12 of Matthew. Look at the, after he calls them that generation of vipers, um, in verse 34, he says in verse 36, But I say unto you, that every idle word that a man shall speak, they shall give an account in the day of judgment. Verse 37, For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thou, thy words thou shalt be condemned. There's a judgment waiting. These guys are rejecting. 
They spoke a word against the Son. When they speak against the Holy Ghost, <laughs> there's a judgment. Condemnation going to fall on them. Now that, there's another passage, Matthew chapter 23. Paul's shaking that serpent in there is certainly a picture of this, although I'm telling you at the same time it's a picture that he is the apostle of the Gentiles. I'll get to that in a second. Matthew chapter 23. And this is that chapter where he just lays into the Pharisees, just calls them hypocrites. Um, in fact, if you look at verse five, 15, He's talking right to their face. Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye can pass seas and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, ye make him twofold more the child of hell than yourselves. And that is, they go out and proselyte, convince people to be followers of them, and as a result of that, they're twofold more the child of hell than the man who proselyte them. The Pharisees, they know they're hypocrites. I mean, they won't admit it, but they know they're hypocrites. The man who they've de they deceived, the that man thinks he's a religious man, he's the truth. That this Pharisee is telling him the truth. So now the man that they've converted is twofold more the child of hell. You've got to convince him that he's wrong doctrinally and that this man isn't telling him the truth before you're ever going to get him saved. So that, these, that the people they convince are worse than they are. Um, but anyhow, so the Lord is scolding them all through this passage. So come over to verse 23. So, no, it's verse 33 I want, isn't it? It's verse 33. It says, yeah... And this is where he relates them to all, all who have rejected from the Old Testament forward. He says, like in verse 32, Fill ye up the measure of your fathers. And uh, he says, ye, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape the damnation of hell? And, and he, he, he'll, if you read on, you find out that every, all the rejection of God's truth in the Old Testament, he says they're all part of that same generation. A generation of vipers... But the, the reason I read this verse, how shall you escape the damnation of hell? They're just like that, serp, that serpent being shaken into fire. That's where, that's where they're headed. And, and these who have rejected not only Jesus Christ, but the ministry of the Holy Spirit, that's where they're going if they don't change their mind in the age of grace and, uh, and get saved during this opportunity that we have in grace. Uh, so anyhow, th that's a picture of that. Uh, now come over to Mark 16. Because when I read about the Apostle Paul bitten by the, by the serpent, in my mind I think of this passage we're about to read, but always wondered why I never read it before this, or saw this happen. For instance, it, in Mark 16, the twelve apostles are, are being commissioned. Now, from our study of the book of Acts, what you realize is when God saved the Apostle Paul, they stopped fulfilling their commission, the twelve apostles, continued to minister to the believing remnant of Israel, but Paul goes out to the, all the lost Jew and Gentile alike. And, and when you understand that Paul's not working under this commission, and that this commission was held off, then, then you can see that, you can see how what, they began to do these things, but they, they're postponed, and they'll continue to do, do those things in the future. Maybe that's confusing to you, but maybe reading the verse will explain. In, in verse, uh, verse 14, and some people were asking me even yesterday about why we think the King James is the right Bible, and I was explaining to them how the other Bibles, if they have these verses, lots, some Bibles end at verse uh, 8 in Mark 16. They won't have from 9 all the way to 20 in their Bible. And... Uh, and, and, and if they have it in the Bible, they'll have a little footnote saying it's not in the best manuscripts and you shouldn't consider it part of the Bible, but they put it in there anyhow. But it's there, and not only is it there, you're going to see it has to be there. Because 
the things that it says. Verse 14 says, Afterwards, the Lord, this is the Lord after His resurrection, appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat, and upbraided them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they believed not them that had seen Him after He was risen. And He said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. So the twelve apostles were to go to everywhere, and, you know, by the way, people who don't recognize Paul in the book of Acts interrupting this ministry will actually teach that God, because the twelve apostles were disobedient, God raised up the apostle Paul because he was obedient. So, twelve wouldn't do what God said, but one guy did. <laughs> Rather than realizing, no, Paul's different than the twelve, and his ministry interrupted what the twelve were doing. There will be a time where the twelve will go to the rest of the world. The ministry will, the, uh, the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world, the Bible says, and then will the end come. But today the message is not the gospel of the kingdom, it's the gospel of the grace of God, the cross work of Christ. So anyhow, but w when they're commissioned here, they're eventually supposed to go to all the world. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, we realize they were told go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, then the uttermost parts of the earth. You see in the book of Acts, Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, you never see the uttermost parts of the earth. So that it got interrupted there by 2,000 years again. Anyhow, verse 16 says, And he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, and he that believeth not shall be damned. And again, you can realize, well, Paul, Paul said, Christ sent me not to baptize. These guys were sent to baptize. Their message is different than Paul's message. It says, And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. Well, we've seen that in the book of Acts, both by, the, by Peter and, and, the, and the twelve apostles. Uh, and by the Apostle Paul. They shall speak with new tongues. Well, we've seen that in the book of Acts, by the Apostles, and even by the Apostle Paul. It says, they shall take up serpents. Well, we never seen anybody do that but Paul. That's, that's why that, that was always peculiar to me, that that's there. It says, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. I, I read those verses about they're waiting for Paul to be harmed, and no harm came to him. The, the, the idea there is hurt. You know, the, there's a harm that's going to come. And, uh, but if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Well, we've seen the apostles do that. The twelve apostles, we've seen Paul do that. Now, the reason I keep saying we saw both of them do those things, except for the first part of verse 18, here's why they were doing it. Verse 19. So, so then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat at the right hand of God. And they went forth preaching everywhere, the Lord working with them, confirming the word, how? With signs following, amen. These signs shall follow. And so they go out and when they, God confirms the word, they're, they're sent by God with a message. The twelve apostles sent to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria with a message. And, and they had God's message for those people, and God confirmed it by the signs that followed. What signs? Well, the signs of, of, of speaking in tongues. That's why, you know, you would never know why they spoke in tongues in Acts chapter 2. There's only one place that tells them they're going to speak in new tongues. That's this passage. That's why the passage has to be there. It fulfills, it fulfills this passage in Acts 2 when they spoke in tongues. Anyhow, they cast out devils, they spoke in new tongues, and they laid hands on the sick and they recovered. But you never read about them drinking any deadly thing, and you never read about them being, uh, taking up serpents and, and not being hurt by the serpents. But you do see it with Paul, which is all, with, like I said, uh, uh, that always kind of amazed me. You know that when Paul did it, that God is showing that he is confirming Paul's words by the signs wonder that, that are following. And certain, certainly when those barbarians saw Paul bit by that serpent, waiting for him to swell up and die, and it doesn't happen, and they change their mind thinking he's not a murderer, he must be a god. The answer is, no, he's not God, but he's a man sent from God. <laughs> they understood that God's involved. They were that close anyhow. By the way... They're barbarians, right? What's the definition of a barbarian? That's last week's lesson. I know I taught something last week. <laughs> Go ahead, Sherry. Yeah, non-Greek speaking culture there. So if they're non-Greek speaking, Paul's a Hebrew, but he speaks the culture of the world. He speaks Greek. 
What is Paul speaking on that island? Must be speaking in tongues, huh? It's implied. I'm sure he communicated, unless you don't think he preached, he just did these things. But if he preached and communicated with these people and they're barbarians, he must be speaking in tongues too. Just something to think about. But, but the point is, is the, now let, let, let's bypass Paul for a moment. Let me show you a couple of verses. Um, back up to Luke chapter 10. Back up, no, go forward. <laughs> Luke chapter 10, next book. Because not only did the Lord send out 12 apostles and they ministered in his earthly ministry as well as after he ascended into heaven, he also sent out during his earthly ministry 70 other people to go out and preach. It says in Luke chapter 10 in verse 1, it says, After these things the Lord appeared, on, uh, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two by two before the face into every city and place whether he himself would come. So he sent 70 out in pairs to go out into all the cities of Israel to the witness of him so that when he came through and witnessed, there, there's a pre-witness and then he comes through and witnesses. And when they went out, he gave them authority as he did with the 12 apostles. It says uh, uh, in verse 17, And the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, uh, I behold Satan as lightning fall from heaven, and behold, I give you power to tread on scorpions, uh, serpents, and then it says, and scorpions, over all the power of the en enemy, and nothing shall by, by any means hurt you. They can't be hurt. Well, that, that's what it said about the twelve apostles when he's going to send them out. They weren't going to, they, nothing could hurt them. And, and these 70, they went out and they're just amazed. And, and uh, verse, verse 20 is an important part of that verse. Notwithstanding, in this rejoice, not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather because your name is written in heaven. That you belong to me. Rejoice in that. Because, you know, you could see why they would rejoice in the power that they had as they went out there. But serpents can't hurt them. And, and he tells them that. Now, I don't know that anyone were ever bit by a serpent. But when he says those things, the actual fulfillment for them is going to be in Revelation. Come to Revelation chapter 9. Revelation 9. And uh, well, I'll just start in the beginning of the chapter. It says, And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star from heaven... Uh, 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 fall from heaven onto the earth and to him, so the star is a spiritual being, was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit and there rose smoke out of, the, out of the pit and the smoke of a great furnace and the sun and the uh, air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. He, remember, those 70 had power over serpents and scorpions. It says in verse 4, and, and, it was, uh, and it was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass or, uh, of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their forehead. Uh, and, and, and to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented five months, and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when it striketh a man. So they can go out and hurt, but they, cannot, they can't hurt the ones that have the mark of God on them. If you just jump back to chapter 7, as the sealed judgments were being issued, there's all of a sudden, verse 2 says of Revelation 7, I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of, of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice unto the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their forehead. And this is where the 144,000, 12 from each tribe of Israel, is sealed to go out and minister the gospel of the kingdom because they're going to preach the gospel of the kingdom and then shall the end come. They're going to go to all the world. In fact, when you read the rest of this chapter, there's people from every nation 
that are rejoicing in heaven because they got saved, the preaching of these 144,000. So what was said to them in Mark, what was already shown in Luke chapter 10, nothing could hurt them. They're going to go out and there's going to be scorpions and serpents and no one's going to hurt them. There's going to be... A, there's going to be a water pollution that's going to pollute the water system and men are going to die from the polluted waters of the earth. But remember, if these men drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. So there's a time, and, and, and certainly the attacks, like when you get over to, well, let's see, go back to chapter 9. There's a couple more verses here. Verse 10 says, And their tail was like unto a scorpion, and, and their sting and their tail is in their tail, and their power was to hurt men five months. You keep reading about them hurting uh, these men, and again in verse 19 it says, uh, for by their power, the, for their power is in their mouth, and this is a different group here, in their, uh, and in their tail, for their tails were like the tail, were like unto serpents, and, and had a head, and was, uh, and with them they do hurt. So these other creatures are like serpents. And when you get it to Revelation 12, just flip over there. When it talks about Satan and his angels being cast out of heaven in the middle of the tribulation, Satan is called this all the way through the book of Revelation, not just here, but verse 9 says, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, which is called the devil and Satan. And he's going to come down, and verse 12 says, And there was rejoicing in heaven, woe unto the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, and having great wrath, because he knoweth he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child, and the woman were given two wings of an eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness in a place where she is nursed for a time, time, uh, and half time from the, from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away in the flood, and the earth helped her. Well, no, there's a verse there about hurt. Where is that verse? <laughs> well, I'm not going to keep reading. You get the idea. Satan's after them. He is a serpent going after them. He can't hurt them. God's protecting some here, and he's trying to hurt others, and, and there's some, some that actually do get hurt, and... So anyhow, you see how that's going to be fulfilled in the tribulation. Now, I guess a long way of saying that is Mark means what he said literally, that they can be bit by a deadly serpent and it will not hurt them. You didn't see it happen to the 12 apostles and the kingdom program until you come to the book of Revelation. The first time you actually see a serpent bite someone and not hurt them was with the apostle Paul, which is a testimony that what was promised and what Israel began to do in the first part of the book of Acts has been postponed until a future date. And in the meantime, God's attention is drawn to the Apostle Paul, who he has the sign that would confirm his word, the sign of an apostle confirming his word. And you see that uh, where Paul actually proves that sign before the kingdom saints ever proved the sign true of them. In the book of Acts, the other signs, they did it first, then Paul did it. This time it happens to Paul first before it ever happens to them. And, and that's interesting and, 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 and signifies who the Apostle Paul is as he's on this island. Come over to, I don't know what to do here. You know why I didn't share that last week, don't you? Well, let, let me just stop there, and because uh, I'm not going to say something in five minutes. That I want to say a little bit more than just the fact that he healed uh, Publius's father, and that's the next thing that takes place. Um, so I've said enough about that. We'll cover the other two miracles, and uh, maybe maybe I'll just share this. Um, no, we'll just stop. Yeah. No, we'll stop. So you got a question or a comment? Something you want to add? To the sea, yeah. Sea, yeah, when the beast rises up out of the sea, rises up out of the nations. Satan is trying to do away with the woman by having a population explosion or something like that. Oh, well, no, I imagine he, if they're hiding in the mountains and he can flood them out. <laughs> I just took it to be literal there. But uh, 
But sometimes an army, like God says, uh, uh, overtaken in a flood is, is a reference to an army flooding the land as well. But yeah, sometimes you just take things in the book of Revelation just as literal, and sometimes they are, they are figurative and represent something else. All right, let's pray. Our God and Father, we thank you that uh, for the study today and, and the very fact that we got a lesson about right division, certainly looking at what began with the nation of Israel and what was supposed to come and never did come because your grace came instead and the fact that the Apostle Paul, that he is verified by you, his word is confirmed through the signs of an apostle that were given to him. And, uh, and so we thank you, Father, that you've opened up this age of grace and that we as Gentiles didn't have to patiently wait for Israel to receive her blessings before a message of salvation was preached to us, but that in your grace you saved us uh, apart from Israel, but fully and completely through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So we thank you for salvation in his name. Amen.